We've now derived the idea of an indifference curve, a set of bundles that you're indifferent between. And we've seen that indifference curves are going to slope down because of the monotonicity assumption, and they're going to bend towards the origin because of the convexity assumption. We now want to take a little closer look at that indifference curve, and in particular at the slope of the indifference curve. Now, of course, there isn't just one slope. The indifference curve starts out steep and it gets shallower and shallower. So the slope is changing along the indifference curve. And we want to ask the question, what does that mean? So let's take this bundle, for example. Here we have a slope that's relatively steep. In other words, the line that's tangent to the indifference curve at that bundle has a relatively steep slope. Suppose that slope is minus 3. That means that when I'm around that bundle, I can go down by 3 on the vertical dimension and over by 1 on the horizontal dimension and end up roughly on the same indifference curve. In other words, I'm willing to give up roughly 3 units of x2 to get one more unit of x1 because that's going to keep me roughly as happy as I was before. So the slope of the indifference curve at this bundle tells me the rate at which I'm willing to trade x2 for x1. I'm willing to trade roughly 3 of x2 for one more of x1. Or I'm willing to substitute roughly 3 of x2 for one more of x1. And that's what's called the marginal rate of substitution. So a marginal rate of substitution is often abbreviated as MRS. And it's how much of x2 you're willing to give up for one more of the good x1. Now that sounds a little bit similar to what we did for the slope of a budget line or a budget constraint. When we did budget lines we had a line whose slope was minus p1 over p2 and we said that slope is how much of x2 you have to give up to get one more of x1. In other words, that slope is the opportunity of x1 in terms of the good x2. But notice the subtle difference in wording. Here is how much of x2 you have to give up. Here is how much of x2 you're willing to give up. What you have to give up to get one more of x1 has everything to do with what Walmart is charging you for x1 and x2. It's determined solely by the prices that we're facing in the store. What we're willing to give up to get one more unit of x1 has everything to do with our tastes, with our preferences. It has nothing to do with prices. What we're willing to do depends on how we feel about the goods. What we have to do in the store depends on what the store is charging us. So these are different concepts, the opportunity cost of x1 versus the marginal rate of substitution that tells us how much we're willing to substitute x2 for x1. And it's called a marginal rate of substitution because it's how much we're willing to substitute one good for another on the margin given where we're currently sitting. Because that marginal rate of substitution is going to change as we change the bundle on the indifference curve. So if we go down here, for example, here we have a much shallower slope. So here maybe the slope is only one-third or minus one-third. That tells us when I'm sitting at this bundle, I'm only willing to give up a third of x2 to get one more of x1. I'm not willing to give up uh, as much of x2 to get one more unit of x1 here as I was here. Well, why is that the case? Well, here we have very little x1 and we have a lot of x2. So because we have a taste for variety, we're willing to give up a lot of what we have a lot of, the x2, 
to get one more of the thing that we don't have very much of, the x1. But when we're sitting at this bundle, we don't have very much of x2, and we have a lot of x1. So we're not willing to give up a lot of what we have very little of at this point, the x2 good, to get more of what we already have a lot of, the x1 good. So our marginal rate of substitution the rate at which we're willing to substitute x2 for x1 changes along the indifference curve. And in particular, it's diminishing along the indifference curve. So we have diminishing marginal rate of substitution along an indifference curve in absolute value, the slope is falling as we move along the indifference curve from left to right. And that diminishing marginal rate of substitution arises from this shape of the indifference curve. And that shape of the indifference curve, of course, arose from our assumption about convexity of tastes, that averages are better than extremes. So this diminishing marginal rate of substitution along an indifference curve arises from the assumption of convexity. If we weren't making that assumption, we wouldn't necessarily have diminishing marginal rates of substitution. But it allows us to see in one more way why the convexity assumption actually makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense that when we have very little of x1, we'd be willing to give up a lot of x2 to get one more unit of x1. But when we have a lot of x1, we're not willing to give up a lot of x2 to get one more unit of x1. But if that makes sense, then diminishing marginal rates of substitution along an indifference curve makes sense. And that means the shape makes sense, which means convexity makes sense. So we have another way of sort of rationalizing why it is that we're assuming uh, convexity about tastes.